Welcome to Quilts, Blankets, and Tapestry, Contemporary Art and Textiles, presented in conjunction with the Berkeley Art Museum and Pacific Film Archives acclaimed exhibition, Rosie Lee Tompkins, a retrospective, co-curated by Elaine Yao and Lawrence Linder. Happily, it will be on view when the museum reopens on April 30th through July 18th. Taking its inspiration from the exhibition, today's program is designed to look at the role of textiles in contemporary practice through the work of three wonderful and varied artists, Ebony G. Patterson, Marie Watt, and Aaron McIntosh. I'm Sherry Goodman, Director of Education, and it's my pleasure to now introduce the artists in the order in which they'll be speaking. Aaron McIntosh is a cross-disciplinary artist and fourth-generation quilt maker whose work mines the intersections of material culture, family tradition, sexual desire, and identity politics. He's a recipient of the 2020 United States Arts Fellowship in Craft. Aaron manages Invasive Queer Kudzu, a community storytelling and archive project across the LGBTQ South. Marie Watt, a citizen of the Seneca Nation, explores the intersection of history, community, and storytelling with interdisciplinary work that draws from, among other sources, Iroquois proto-feminism and indigenous teachings. Her work is held in the collections at, of museums such as the Whitney Museum of American Art and the Smithsonian Institution's National Museum of the American Indian. Ebony G. Patterson draws viewers into bearing witness to violence and social injustice through opulent hand embellished surfaces, often combining found textiles, we spoke tapestry and thrift store objects. Her first major West Coast exhibition titled When the Cuts Erupt, The Garden Rings and the Warning is a Wailing opened last month at the Institute for Contemporary Art San Jose. Our moderator is Julie Rodriguez Widholm, director of the Berkeley Art Museum and Pacific Film Archive. Now just a quick word about format. Each artist will talk about their work for about 10 minutes followed by discussion. You'll then have a chance to ask questions. Please submit questions through the Q&A function and any comments on chat. Now I'll turn the program over to Julie. Hi everyone, thanks for joining us this, this afternoon. Um, I'm thrilled and, and so thankful to our three artists for their willingness to join us in conversation uh, on the occasion of Rosie Lee Tompkins retrospective at BAM PFA, the largest and most comprehensive exhibition of Rosie Lee Tompkins work to date. It includes about 70 quilts, piece tops, embroideries, assemblages, and decorated objects. And it reveals Tompkins to be an artist of extraordinary variety, depth, and impact. Uh, it will be on view when we reopen the museum uh, starting on May 2nd, and we've extended it through July 18th. As you can see here in these installation images, um, it's really a, a visually extraordinary. Uh, and I, I think the opportunity to speak to some contemporary artists who have similarly been inspired and work with textiles of, of various sorts um, speaks to how the uh, contemporary art field has been I think seeing a reemergence in these an interest in these in these materials uh, which our three artists will help us explore in more depth today so thank you all for joining us I would like to turn it over to our first speaker which is Aaron Hi, uh, welcome everyone. Uh, thank you, what, a, what an invitation it was to receive this. Um, I, Rosie Lee Tompkins uh, is an artist whose work I was shown, uh, I think even before I was an undergrad, I think one of my high school fiber arts teachers introduced me to her work. Um, so I'm very excited to, uh, to talk about my work um, and be on this stage uh, with two other brilliant artists tonight uh, and your community at the Berkeley Art Museum. So thank you for having me. Um, to start off, um, quilts, weeds, a shabby colonial revival couch. My works reach across generational divides through a language of form and material dialect. Stories of cruising men and family pastimes collide to draw attention to the murky intersection of personal desires and family institutions. Next slide, please. My work is rooted in the material process and cultural attributes of quilt making. As a fourth generation quilter, this handwork tradition is in my bones. 
While an overview of my body of work might otherwise suggest a multimedia approach, quilt-like accumulation and unit-based piecework are truly primary across my practice. Whether personal or communal, minimal or maximal, quilts are flexible, open objects, full of possibility. Next slide. I see piecework, working with scraps as a global paradigm, as a cognitive framework for understanding the complex ways that identities are forged by their scraps of connection to other people, media, and communities. Next slide. Piecework itself can be traditional, rigid, or structured. It can be loose, intuitive, encoded with symbolism, or practically illegible. I think of identity as similarly multivalent, and along the lines of crafting, it's something that we work on, obsess over, and tend to with care. So I've chosen this patchwork medium to unload many disparate thoughts about my identities. Uh, queer, Appalachian, textile nerd, academic, hopeless romantic, stray son, feminist, artist. And uh, with this slide, I'm, I'm also a textile educator. And uh, this is just a smattering of uh, student piecework samples. We always, in the first few weeks of class, do a scrap exchange to talk about that tradition. Uh, and make a collective uh, quilt or piecework as a group. Next slide, please. In my quilted works, I'm stripping away the quaint Americana charm factory status of them, peeling back cultural layers and infusing the medium with the realities of what happens beneath quilts, desire, sex, death and birth. Along with furniture forms, my quilts center the domestic context of consuming mediated desires using gay lifestyle magazines, erotica, pornography, and personal ads in works like be these, Bedroom Buddies and Little Big Man, I bring these images of hunky men, jocks, bulging daddies out from underneath the mattress and display them proudly on top. Next slide. In these works, I use traditional quilt patterns such as double wedding ring, chain links, or peculiar ones like Daddy Hex uh, as I comb through quilt archives. These patterns obscure the figures. Uh, they complicate any kind of easy cruise um, one might find in the images, nodding to my own hesitancies around body image and gay male objectification. In the same manner, my desire for, to have a fulfilling relationship with my family and their traditions also exists tantalizingly out of reach. Next slide. In an ongoing uh, series loosely titled Fragments, uh, over the years I've addressed this disjointed, scrappy, unfinished nature of identity. Quilts such as Force Frolic and Road to Tennessee feature gay erotica figures that have been raggedly removed, leaving backdrops of nature and anonymous erotic silhouettes. Um, also highly referential cruising cultures, these works contain as much personal fantasy as lonely fear. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. Um, another body of work, <clears throat> Transitional Objects, builds on this theme of extraction, a series of baby blankets that riff on the childhood attachment theory of psychoanalyst Donald Winnicott. These quilts are rooted in my childhood, uh, but they also examine a long, slow unfolding of adult sexuality, eroticism, and discursive desires. Silhouetted figures from a range of sources are constructed in patchwork with image recognition only available to viewers who pick up and unfold the blankets. Next slide, please. Recently, my practice has seen a, a shift towards an interrogation of the queer bodies, articulations, and vulnerabilities in nature. In 2013, as my grandmother was passing away, I spent a summer with my mother's family out in her garden, picking weeds and tending a final crop. This experience became the impetus for weeds, my interpretations of disregarded local plants made queer by my patchwork skins of vintage fabrics and printed gay erotica, the things that constitute me. I draw a covert line of connection between these unwanted plants of our family garden and my own anxious efflorescence as a queer person in a culture steeped in heteronormative traditions. Next slide. Eventually, I decided to take on the ultimate Southern weed, uh, which in California or wherever you might be coming from, you may not know much about, but that would be kudzu. That's what this image is of, the vine that ate the South. 
Both environmental nuisance and fixture of the landscape, the tenacious kudzu vine figures prominently in our Gothic mythologizing of the American South. An invasive species, which was actually imported by the USDA from Japan at mid-century for soil erosion control, kudzu now engulfs entire landscapes from Virginia to Texas. So also added to the USDA's noxious weed watch list in the 1990s, Kudzu taps into fears of otherness, xenophobia, connected in many ways to perceptions of queerness and the persistent fear that a homosexual agenda might sweep the nation if left unchecked. This is a very ripe, potent thought where I'm from. Today, uh, marriage equality has been the law of the land since 2015, yet the Southern home of Kudzu has become a sullied stage in our national political theater a proving ground of sorts for homophobic and transphobic legislation that continues to this day uh, with strong force. Lost in this politicized fray are the lives, memories, stories, and histories of Southern LGBTQ and our ingenuity contending with the conservative status quo. Next slide. Initially, I was responding to this rage and invisibility by making kudzu for myself, indexing my own queer desire, and identity through gay materials such as those used in prior works. Next slide. As I grappled with how to bring about the mass that is kudzu per that other image, I realized how much more powerful and political it would be to tell the stories of many other Southern queers. And this led to the conceptualization of the Invasive Queer Kudzu Project. Uh, you'll notice in these, um, these, these graphics here is interesting from the Williams Institute in California, actually, we. We now have more data on uh, people who self-identify as LGBTQ and the South as per the graphic is actually home to the vast majority um, of queer identified people in the United States. So, um, and yet also uh, the place where in the Alabama State House, uh, transphobic legislation is being uh, debated and passed to this day. Um, so in, um, in the beginning, I felt charged to create Southern Queer Kudzu uh, through a historical lens. Next slide. After visiting archives such as the Houston-based BOTS and Gulf Coast archives, um, as well as also in California, the One Archive in LA, um, I began producing the project's first vines, but distinctly felt something amiss in all these stories from a queer past. I didn't completely trust the archives I was resourcing to tell the full story of Southern queer life at the intersections of race, non-binary genders, and class. Uh, and just on this slide, it's, it's kind of worth noting, you know, um, because queer archives across the South are, are few, far between, fragile, a lot of times they're still run by individuals, sometimes in church basements, which is the case of the bots in Houston. Um, I did have to travel to larger ones like one in LA to, to do this kind of research to, um, find uh, more, more images of my people, so to speak. Next slide, please. Um, I decided that the project must include voices and stories from the present alongside those from the past. All stories are vital and welcome in this project's goal to invade dominant Southern narratives with queer stories that have been obscured for so long. Next slide. So since 2015, I've been traveling across the Southern states, collecting stories of LGBTQ people through community workshops and from these special archives. And next slide. Drawing on the preeminence of quilting in Southern folkways, the collected stories, photographs, and digitized archive documents are quilted into kudzu vines and leaves. These are a great example there of some of those. Next slide. To date, the project has accumulated uh, over 7,200 story leaves and is presented as installations of queer kudzu invading emblematic and problematic monuments of the South, such as Confederate statuary, Jim Crow era segregation architecture, state houses, churches, mental asylums, and other structures that symbolize oppressive histories. Former gay bars, nightclubs, and other queer landmarks that have become targets for removal are also called upon in this work. For each of the larger exhibitions, the monument being blanketed in the kudzu is, is specific to the intersectional anti-oppression struggles in that region. So next slide, please. Um, this is the first big exhibition in Basic Queer Kudzu Baltimore, and it featured a ghostly replica of Baltimore's Club Hippo, reclaimed by 
more queer stories, memorializing one of the country's oldest continuously operating gay dance clubs, which in 2015 sadly became a CVS pharmacy. The club's official motto was where everybody is welcome and the hippo grew to be one of Baltimore's most inclusive spaces. Next slide. It was the kind of place where drag shows, leather competitions, karaoke, gay bingo, and themed events welcomed patrons of all stripes. As a monument and memoriam, the Club Hippo Memorial celebrates the power of dance, nightlife, and connection that gay clubs have provided for queer communities for generations. And also points to the, to the decline of such sites as the twin forces of gentrification and social media erode the necessity of queer only space. Next slide. Um, and this is the last project I'll share in Basic Queer Kudzu Richmond. Uh, which I opened in 2019, featured several monuments of the South in the process of being invaded by queer kudzu stories. Most notably, a two-scale recreation of the Jefferson Davis monolith holding sway over Monument Avenue in Richmond. Next slide. Being unanimously suggested for removal by a commission of key stakeholders in 2018, Restrictions in Virginia state laws govern the removal, governing the removal of war memorials at that time ensured a co the column would not be felled anytime soon. This was an ongoing years long debate. Taking a cue from the Parisian communards felling of the Vendome column and its subsequent reconstruction as well as romantic era excursions to crumbling architectural antiquity sites invasive Richmond aimed to expedite such removal. However, the destroyed monument was left in situ in the gallery to contemplate the legacy of these problematic historic monuments and how destruction itself might be viewed as a critical stage in the life cycle of human history. Next slide. And our next slide. Activating the Feld Memorial, the project hosted a series of picnics amongst the vine covered ruins on weekends during the run of the exhibition. Next slide. It featured queer quilting bees, as well as lectures and demonstrations by various speakers, community organizers, and kudzu enthusiasts. We had kudzu basket weaving workshops and dance parties with local artists. And my last slide there. In closing, uh, it would be remiss uh, to not celebrate the actual demolition of this monument, the Jefferson Davis one, which occurred this past summer after months of Black Lives Matter protest in the wake of the murder of George Floyd. Thank you so very much. I'll pass the baton over to Marie. Thank you, Erin. And um, thank you everyone for attending today. So um, in 2003, I started working with uh, blankets in my work. And uh, I was interested in using this material because of how blankets are a part of uh, my history as a Seneca person and also our family, there is a tradition of give, giving blankets away to honor people for being witness to important life events. I started by uh, looking for wool blankets at uh, thrift stores and would purchase anything $5 and under. I was never selecting a blanket for any kind of aesthetic um, characteristics or, or colors. Uh, and I started with the goal of making something that uh, a totem or a columnar form um, that might reference linen closets uh, that would be ladder-like and create perhaps this um, passageway for Sky Woman, a figure in the Seneca and Iroquois creation story. I was also interested in how this column form would reference conifers of the Pacific Northwest, um, Brand Cousy's Endless Column and even um, the totem poles of Coast Salish people. Um, so next slide. One of the things that I realized in working with the blankets is uh, as people would come and um, enter my studio, which is really at my home at the time, uh, people would often comment on how uh, the blanket was a marker for a memory and story. They'd basically break out into story. And so uh, one of the things that I started to really understand in working with this material is that we're received in blankets and we're constantly imprinting on them. And in many ways, we depart this world in a blanket too. 
Uh, this image is of um, a very early sewing circle in my home in 2003. And I started adding um, doors and um, workhorses uh, to create and extend my, my table. And uh, in 2003, email was um, a new mode of communication and uh, there was no social media, but I invited people using email as a tool uh, to come and stitch. And I said, no sewing experience is necessary. You can come and go as you are. I'll feed you and um, bring, bring people. And uh, one of the things that I found is that not only did people come, but as our eyes were diverted and we all uh, were busy stitching, stories often flowed. Uh, one thing I'd like to share is that uh, the sewing circles are really um, deliberate uh, in the, the name and that historically uh, sewing bees were actually used to colonize indigenous women and girls. So one of the things I was interested in with the sewing circles is that um, I was thought of them as being these like barn raisings in which many hands make light work and um, in which uh, I would also um, help out my neighbors when they needed um, assistance with different projects too. Next slide. So one of the first pieces that was realized is um, this, this piece called braid. And the first saw time I actually saw it in its entirety, it was when it was installed at the Smithsonian National Museum of the American Indian at the George Gustav High location in Manhattan. I think one thing that's important to realize is that with this piece is that the blankets, I never was, um, again, collecting blankets for a particular color. So these are kind of the blankets that were in my, um, my cache at the time. Next slide. One of the things that I became interested in is how each person's um, stitch is unique and kind of like a signature or thumbprint. Next slide. This piece uh, here, Untitled Dreamcatcher, uh, was stitched uh, at sewing circles at the University of uh, Nebraska and the Sheldon Museum. And uh, then it gestated for a period of four years and um, was eventually uh, finished for a project. And one of the things that I think that stands out in this particular piece is uh, my interest in satin bindings. I think of them as being ledger-like and uh, I'm drawn to how they capture dreams, both literally and metaphorically. Next slide. Uh, in order to, I guess, better um, invite people to sewing circles, I created my own stitch and or my own sign. And here it's positioned at the National Gallery of Canada in Ottawa. I also um, started making prints to exchange with for people's participation. Next image. So at this particular event in 2015, there were over 225 percent participants in the course of three hours. And one of the things that I love about this image is I think about a traditional uh, Seneca and Iroquois or Haudenosaunee longhouse and all these people gathered at this um, shared table and shared circle. Uh, one of the things that happened in my practice is I started um, creating smaller panels that would come together and sometimes the imagery was taped using uh, masking tape. One of the things that's really important about the sewing circles is that they're um, that all ages are invited to participate. And our participants have probably been as young as two or three and um, as young as 91. Next image. So this is a piece that was created in collaboration with Sewing Circles at the Block Museum for an exhibition called, If You Remember, I'll Remember. And the text in it is a stream of consciousness associations with the word mother. And the text was generated both uh, in my studio and also with uh, the indigenous students and students at uh, Northwestern University. Next slide.
In this uh, project, oftentimes the panels um, aren't finished during the context of the sewing circles, but they're, um, they're started and then they come back to the studio and then they go back out into the community. And so one of the things that I'm drawn to in this practice is this kind of uh, call and response that happens. And one of the things that I started to learn in using text is that I think I'm drawn to how um, people's stitches start to relate to perhaps um, the cadence of one's body and the extension of one's voice. Next image. So the sewing circle uh, that took place at the Block Museum was done in collaboration with uh, Evanston Community Partners. And it was decided that the sewing circle would be a um, equity sewing circle, which was a growing conversation in their community. And during this sewing circle, there were over 125 participants. Next image. And one of the things that um, I love about the sewing circles is I really think of them as an event unto themselves and an action in which what is made is um, friendships and conversation and, um, and, and, and then of course the embroidery of, of cloth. I also wanted to point out that the woman on the right here is a person that I met named Melissa Blount. And she is a professional psychologist who after participating in this sewing circle, went on to um, host her own sewing circles called the Black Lives Matter Sewing Circles in which she created um, and continues to create quilts uh, and projects. That, and the first project she did was um, a project that recognized women and girls who died to gun violence in Chicago. And uh, the project involved creating quilt square, squares that embroidered each um, woman's name. Next image. Uh, this is an example of just what the work looks like in a incomplete state in the studio with a young assistant. Next slide. And uh, this is uh, the exa an example of the work uh, hanging in space. And one of the things that this particular project um, invited me to consider is both is the B side of, of the piece. And so this particular project has an A side and a B side and people are invited to walk around uh, the assemblage in its entirety. And I think that by hanging it in this way, it's truer to the nature of our experiences with blankets. And it also allows the um, blanket um, to move uh, with uh, the, the elements. And in some ways, uh, we become uh, wrapped around them. So one of the reasons um, when I was, I think, in preparing for this conversation today, I guess I love this uh, tradition of radical improvis improvisation that people um, point to in Rosie Lee Tompkins' work. And for me, um, this process of sewing circles in my practice uh, is akin um, to this sort of um, improvisational practice. Uh, last, I wanted to just say that um, there is a elder who often says that my stories change when I know your stories. And I think that that's the one, one of the elements that draws me to um, continuing sewing circles to this day. Thank you. It's time for M Ebony now. Thank you, Murray. Thank you, Erin. Um, thanks so much. Uh, for having me and hi everyone. Good evening. If a tree falls in the forest and no one is there, does it make a sound? This statement evokes ideas of visibility and invisibility. Sorry, this this sorry, this statement evokes ideas of visibility and invisibility, as well as the act of bearing witness. This has been a lingering undercurrent throughout my practice. Popular contemporary cultural archetypes, locales, and conduits 
such as social media have created new spaces for the disenfranchised to be visible. In conjunction with this new visibility, I've also considered bling and its relationship to light as a device of illumination. I am interested in the way dress creates a moment of importance for someone who may be deemed otherwise unimportant due to their social, economic, or political status or location. The work examines social hierarchy within a so-called post-colonial space. And this relationship to dress, disenfranchisement, body politics, invisibility, and visibility while asking the audience to bear witness. Olive Senior, Jamaica's current poet laureate, wrote an incredibly powerful and seminal collection of poems titled Gardening in the Tropics first published in 1994 that echoes in the halls of my practice. Her poem, Brief Lives, is often a point of reflection and rumination. I'll read it for you. Gardening in the tropics, you never know what you'll turn up, quite often bones. In some places, they say, when volcanoes erupt, they spew out dense and monumental as stones the skulls of the desaparecidos, the disappeared ones. Mine is only a kitchen garden, so I unearth just occasional skeletons. The latest was a young man from the country who lost his way and crossed the invisible boundary into rival political territory. I buried him again so he can carry on growing. Our cemeteries are thriving too, the newest addition was a drug baron, white out in territorial competition, who had this stunning funeral, complete with 21 gun salute, and attended by everyone, especially young girls, famed for the vivacity of their dress, their short skirts, and even briefer lives. In the last numbers of in the last number of years, my work has centered on the garden as a metaphor for post-colonial space. I've been increasingly interested in the language of the garden as a metaphor of site, uh, sorry, as a metaphor of a site of power, burial, dress, memorial, mourning, witnessing, and renewal. I'm interested in the ways these languages unfold in the so-called post-colonial society as it relates to those who are disenfranchised and more specifically black bodies. I've been recently meditating on the labor of mourning and its relationship to the land. As Martinican born poet and theorist Edward Glissant states, our landscape is our only monument. Its meaning can be traced from its underside. I've been meditating on the statement by Glissant that recognize the landscape as holding the truth. If a garden is a tool of beauty, a site of embellishment on the land, the beauty is concealing something that may not be acknowledged and that may be ugly. To understand, to understand the site of the garden, a dig therefore is necessary. In my work, I'm considering the gardens that are unattended to while thinking about them as sites of survival. Here, things live and die in spite of neglect. But within it all, the truth is buried as we wail upon the land for the loss, but also celebrating in pageantry and dress. There's an understanding of the fragility and uncertainty of life within these gardens. I've grown increasingly interested in thinking about the environments that my subjects rest in. I've been developing lavish surroundings that surround um, that seem garden-esque in their treatment, populated by flora, glitter, embellishments, insects, birds, weeds, reptiles, bodies, and various objects. The work has a visual density that is strategically seductive as I employ these tools to, to seduce the viewer in an act of witnessing. I'm also thinking too about the weight and vulnerability it means to bear, bear witness. 
It all seems beautiful, but is it really? This is my attempt at a fly trap. There's a visual excavation that I'm asking the viewer to do through the act of looking. In the work, bodies are often shrouded and sometimes flattened because of continued layering and embellishment. I'm burying them, planting them, embedding them within the fibers of the surfaces, between the layers and below the work's soil. My work explores a number of materials and surfaces such as paper, mixed media tapestries, as well as installations, video and performance. The works are painterly opulent and lush within their compositions and surfaces. With this, with this seductive formal qualities of my work, I want to draw the viewer in and force them to bear witness to social injustices imposed upon those deemed invisible or invisible due to their social, economic, or geopolitical status. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, that was amazing. Um, well, we have a few dis discussion items uh, to, to, to share. Uh, there are some themes that we addressed that seem to uh, relate to each of your practices. So I'd like to begin with a question of how does storytelling or narrative, albeit personal, political, or historical narrative manifest in your work? And kind of related to that, what are the intergenerational exchanges within your within the storytelling or narrative within your work? Well, I mean, my work is really is deeply connected to intergenerational exchanges. Um, I grew up, I, a, a way that I talk about my relationship to, to this medium, uh, to quilts in particular and, and working with scraps, um, that is the first art form I ever saw. I didn't, I'm from a really place in rural Tennessee. I noticed that was someone's question in the Q and A. Um, a very small town called Kingsport. And um, it's in the Appalachian foothills. I, I didn't um, actually go to an art museum until I went to college, like one that you would call an art museum. So, um, you know, I had a like a teenage hood, like full of books from used bookstores and the local library um, as a way to understand, but I never saw art in person. But I did have a, a long history of being exposed to quilts. Um, you know, it kind of took uh, leaving where I'm from to really understand the, the bigger ways in which um, that work is seen and not seen um, in American culture. Um, I, I also grew up with a lot of family stories around quilt makers. Uh, I had, I guess, it, in some ways it's, it's notable, but uh, the more quilt history you learn about, it's not. But I had grandfathers who were quilt makers. Um, one of them was a widower and just as a sharecropper would have taken on those kinds of activities for his family. Um, and um, just held a really special pride of place in my family. My, my father and my brother are also woodworkers. So it was kind of a, a upbringing of a lot of making. Um, in my own work, um, every, I kind of, I've started to actually sort of reframe everything I ever make is usually a story. It's a lot of times it's driven by some uh, event in my personal life. And then it, I'll kind of ping off of all these other pop cultural references. Um, uh, a lot, of, I'm really interested in kind of finding myself in these other um, given narratives that are out there. That was, that's been my experience being a queer person from a rural place and not meeting other queer people till I was much older. Um, so, I'm interested in that. And then I guess one final thing about the intergenerational thing is that I, um, I this just kind of occur, it, it started happening to me in the studio, but I, I would remember these little stories from one grandmother in particular, who was very, um, a, very much in the vein of Rosie Lee Tompkins, um, uh, or how I imagine and what I know of Rosie Lee Tompkins, but um, she didn't use rulers. Quilting was like a real pleasure for her. It was absolutely her art form that um, she took up in kind of all her spare bits of time. And I remember helping her with little bits and pieces. Um, she kept them rolled up under the, her couch and would just kind of pull them up when we would visit. Um, and I have some of those quilts and I have some of her things she didn't finish before she died. And those are sort of materials that percolate in and out of my work. But I, um, I try and I remember her being a real stickler about she didn't use rulers 
she would cut up cereal boxes if she was going to use a pattern for something. And so I've tried to embody those kind of practices in my own, uh, in my own practice, um, not, not be as obsessed and as concerned with precision and just kind of try and follow the intuitive line of the stitch. And, um, and that's the way I, I connect to her in a weird way. I didn't get to know her so richly when she was alive. Um, I guess that I, I would, you know, I don't, I, I do not come from a history of, uh, of, of makers in the same way that Aaron, um, or maybe Marie does, but my, I'd like to think that in many ways, like my, I am the manifestation of my parents' bravery. Um, you know, both my parents came from like deep rural, um, poverty, um, in Jamaica, um, one came from the northern end of the island, one came from the southern end of the island. Um, you know, my father, uh, you know, had to drop out, of, he was a middle kid, he had to drop out of school at age nine, and, I mean, not age nine, not in grade, in grade, um, grade nine, um, and had to work to support family. Uh, my mother was the only one of nine children who went to um, who went to high school, but going to high school then was also such a huge deal. Um, my mother, uh, my mother, however, is, is an incredibly creative person, um, and I think that if her uh, social um, or economic circumstances were different uh, growing up, that she may have become an actress because she did uh, reveal to me as a young adult um, that that was something that she was always interested. In, you know that she but didn't didn't have examples of that um but as children they would make their own dolls out of straw um uh from the yard they would gather um straw or grass and make um and make dollies because they you know they couldn't afford to have um to have them my mother is an avid gardener um she also sings. My father used to sing, used to dance all the time um, on weekends. But also too, what I think is also really interesting is that, you know, when I told my parents that I wanted to become an artist, um, they, you know, they both looked at me with like shock. <laughs> what is this? What do you mean? Um, but you know, like my my formative years of learning how to draw, it was my parents who taught me how to draw. My father taught me how to draw birds. And my mother taught me how to draw, um, how to draw people. And even though they didn't understand understand what it meant to be an artist, and even so, I don't think I fully, I didn't fully understand what it um what it necessarily meant either until like I went to art college um back home. Um, and you know, like my first sense of like what it meant to be an artist were or what it meant to be an artist in the sense of survival was, you know, like um all demonstrated to me by all of my teachers who were who were incredible, um, um, who were incredible and are incredible um, people. Um, but then uh, when I think about like, especially like in the last few years of my practice, my father passed in 2010. And that's when I realized like a, a very um, notable shift um, one in the first in the way I was making um, images, like I started like erasing the skins of uh, of all my um, models, and then somehow I was always I started like laying all the bodies down, so I was burying them, um, or just erasing skins and having to deal with like um, uh, the ghosting of the of the you know of the of the forms. And it took me like five years. Um, when I had to give like a talk, I think it was at like MAD, um, and I realized just pulling all these images together that, oh my God, I, you know, like I'd been manifest, manifesting all my morning uh, through the, um, through the work. And then um, even though, even for all that time, I, I wasn't necessarily talking about the work in that way. Someone had introduced me to Olive Senior's work after just seeing me post something, I, um, which, which I, I, I always say that Olive Senior in many ways gave me a language at a time when I didn't, um, when I didn't have it, that the work had kind of gone ahead of me and I, and somehow my verbiage hadn't, um, hadn't caught up. Um, and I, and, you know, like, I think that um, as artists, somehow all of our personal, personal narratives always enter the work, whether directly or indirectly. Um, on the day that I also buried my father, I also, um, after dropping off family members, I came across a, a murder scene. Um, and so that, you know, 
every time I have to think about like the anniversary of my father's passing, I'm also sharing that, um, sharing that memory um, with somebody else who had also passed who I, who I didn't know. And so there's constantly for me, um, uh, when what I realized in the turning of the work, this negotiation between public and, um, and private mourning, and then also to like, uh, the, the bodies that were always centered in um, centered in uh, in my work were all, always ref, uh, reflective of working class uh, working class people who might you know the, my family who I was dropping off this is, I was dropping them off in a working class community so I felt like I couldn't on there was no way I was ever going to be able to look at the work in the same way or speak about the work in the same way um, and that shifted um, shifted everything. And I guess for, for me, um, storytelling was a significant um, part of uh, my experience or of my youth. And I have to be honest and say, I don't think I really appreciated it. My mom uh, worked in Indian education for 27 years. And one of the things that was happening in, and this was in um, the Pacific Northwest and uh, one of the things that happened as a result of uh, Indian relocation policy by the federal government is there were all these indigenous people living in urban areas. And so as an Indian education specialist, she was working to really ensure that students would have success uh, and graduate, not drop out of school. They always, we uh, indigenous students start as strong students, but then there was a high dropout rate. And so then the other arm to what she would do was cultural programming. And um, she started a, a story circle in which um, uh, we shared our stories and we learned our stories. And, uh, and so that became a really important to me. And I don't think I understood the importance of it, um, like Aaron was saying, until I left home. Sometimes you don't know what's important to you until you kind of leave, leave home. And um, my dad reminds me that I like like protested um, going to these programs though when I was a kid and teenager. And so um, that's like a lesson to me now as, as a parent. Um, so that, that's just one um, kind of significant example of, of how I see storytelling kind of having an impact in my work. And I too, um, I, I guess I think a lot of times it's hard for me to go to a site or do a project without thinking about the story that relates to a place and, and really acknowledging the indigenous community in that, that place. So that's like a story that's really important to me. And then another aspect of working with blankets is I actually do invite people to um, contribute blankets to projects and share a story in exchange for a print. And, and so um, I feel like I'm a custodian of, of these, these stories and it's really important to me that, that they be amplified. Um, you just used a word I'm often also referring to, or I refer to in the Invasive Queer Kudzu Project as myself as like a steward, mm -hmm. uh, which is why I don't really claim authorship of that work. I sort of always refer to, I've, I've managed the project, but um, there are so many at this point people who've been involved and there are so many other stories and um, there's a, a real connection between these projects of ours in that regard, Marie. And you've done a project, is it, I guess it's, I don't know how much it's out there published with um, Chinupa. Yeah, yeah, Chinupa, Hans Galuger and I are um, working uh, toward a show that will open at the Denver Art Museum on May 22nd, I believe. And um, yeah, we've done a public call for people to participate and embroider a word um, that they want to share with others in this moment on a bandana. And um, we had over 800 participants in that project and we've built a um, sculpture together and that will be unveiled um, at the end of May. Excited to see that. Yeah. Um, so I'm fascinated by how textiles, quilts and tapestries are a function as both image and object, kind of occupying space on the floor or on the walls and dialogue with painting, sculpture, collage, and so on. So I wonder how you each approach the fluidity of this form. And I suppose that can also relate to the notion of improvisation that came up a little bit earlier. Um, 
Well, you know, I, I, I mean, I, I, I think of myself as a painter. So I think also to have a very <laughs> uh, different entry point as a, um, as a language um, that I think about, that I think with first, right? And, it, and that just goes back, to, I, I've just not been able to unlearn some things. Um, <laughs> um, but also too, like, I, I think it's kind of funny because I remember when I started rejecting wanting to work on like uh, Canvas at all, I hated it all together um, and started working on paper in my undergraduate years. Um, and working with um, like working with making oil paintings with on watercolor paper and um, using gauze. I remember doing, you know, like I was always interested in somehow uh, building surfaces up, adding other kind of material complications, much to the distress of um, of um, some of my tutors who would say, you know, this isn't gonna last. And I go, but isn't that amazing? You know, that it'll be something else um, and that somebody will get this and it'll be something else like in a, few years as if it's a living, breathing uh, body. Um, and it's always making big things. That's not, that's never been new for me. I mean, I was making like 14 foot paintings when I was in like a second year undergrad. So it, it and, I, and I came from a tradition, like I went to a school of like big painters. Um, but I think that, you know, like, so I, I've never considered myself a purist. I've always been interested in like the language of materials and how I could relate that to painting or just like the language of materials. I don't even know that, you know, like it's when I get asked this stuff, you know? I don't think any of us like go into the studio and we go thinking like, oh my God, you know, how does this factor into textiles or how does this factor into painting? I just use whatever is available to me and what makes the most sense uh, for the ideas and what makes the most sense um, uh, in terms of like the formal decision. Some, and I mean, I spend a lot of like, when we were all moving about all the time, I would like, whenever I'd go home, I'd always load up. Or if I went somewhere for an exhibition um, or something, I would say, um, I would, you know, say ahead of time, could we organize a few hours so I could go to a thrift shop or go to a fabric store? Um, and I would always love going to a thrift shop or, you know, like a, a repurposed or like a Goodwill or something, because I think it always, it, you know, like if you're only in a place for a short, a short span of time, like going to a thrift store kind of gives you a snapshot, a really quick snapshot of a, uh, of a community. And then, you know, you just find some really interesting treasures and I take them back with me. And I don't know when they get you. Sometimes they get you, sometimes it, you know, like it takes like 10 years and it's like, oh my God, look at this thing, you know? Um, or sometimes you just like, you know, it's in the, you're in the, middle of, in the middle of the night and you're watching some like random documentary about like bleeding trees online. And then all of a sudden you start thinking about vultures and you're like, oh, where can I get a vulture? And then you start, you know, it's, it's 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 kind of like a thread you know you just keep pulling and pulling and, and and pulling at it and turning you know turning that slowly and somehow it manifests into um you know these other considerations and i think that's what makes it ex it that's what makes it exciting um about practice uh, about you know like having a practice where you are open um, open in your questioning, open in, uh, and, and what, what questioning means can mean many things in relation to ideas or in, or in relation to materials. And I mean, practice also too is just fundamentally about play. I mean, otherwise, if you're not playing, then it's just a job, you know, and who wants to do that? You know, um, <laughs> nobody wants to do a job. Um, but I feel like I digressed. Hold on, I'm trying to look back at a question. Um, but yeah, if I think, if I remember anything else after Aaron and Marie speak, then I'll just chime in, but yeah. Okay, great, thank you. <laughs> I really like listening to like what, in the context of the sewing circles, when panels that are in different states of completion come back, just like looking at them and looking at all of them together and, and, um, and it, ends up automatically kind of changing what's possible in in the work and how I move forward. So there's that aspect of improvisation. I also think, and I'm curious if this happens with Aaron, but I think when you sit down and you're talking with other people and you're making things and there's no pressure to talk because your eyes are diverted, but like you hear stories and, and you find intersections in your stories. And, and that oftentimes leads me to place to work that I end up making too. How about you, Erin? 
Yeah, it's it's somewhat similar. And I actually, I wrote a little note when I was looking at your, the I love that you refer to them as the B-sides. Um, it's such a, uh, it's a cool thing about quilts too. They often have like both sides or attended to differently, you know? Um, that's one difference towards your, your or I guess a, a kind of difference to call out per Julie's question. But um, yeah, is that the, like when you showed that, you know, I, I can't help but look at like all the different ways people like started and finished their word that they they stitched um, mm -hmm. on their small blanket thing. And I mean, that to me was like, those are all these little markers of those people's identity that like, you know, what who what they bring to the table, like what they brought to that work and that process with you, you know, it's like, mm -hmm. are they big stitches? Are they tiny and petite? You know, like, are, are they really like finely laid? You know, like all those sorts of things. Um, I love that. I mean, I, it's, it kind of surprised me. I admittedly was uh, very critical for a long time of like social practice kind of work. And I, I didn't, um, not from like an antagonistic standpoint, just that, um, you know, I uh, also grew up in like a community that benefited from a lot of like particular social programs. And um, I just, in the heyday of some of these craftivist movements, it sort of seemed like people imagined that offering these activities could be like stand-ins or like replacement of like actual social services that are needed. And the U.S. doesn't do a good job of funding. Mm -hmm. um, so, um, but I, I had, same, same towards what you're saying, Marie, it's been like very transformative um, in my practice. I think it's, um, it's opened up um, certainly, like I said earlier, I didn't always used to think that like the things I was making were stories. Um, but now I actually kind of feel like storytelling is really in my mix and friends have told me for years, you know, I, I definitely love to spin a yarn and I definitely like keep track of a lot of particular weird memories. And um, so, yeah. Um, one like final thing I, I not to uh, like, not to dig into it, but I, I guess just, you know, being, um, I guess, I don't know, I'm, I'm disinterested in like proximity to textiles, like who, who has it, who isn't, um, but um, being like educating future generations of people who work with textiles. And um, I mean, that's something I've always really loved is that you have painters who, you know, it's like they're, they're amazing painters and then they actually find a whole nother language per Ebony's words um, in working through cloth, you know, in a different way, working through different materials. Um, it's part of the magic of teaching is that you kind of get to like have these small, like, or you get to experience alongside other people, like these epiphanies of uh, falling in love with material, like, like, seeing pleasure in making like um it's a real privilege to be around that um i think I, I i something i think about a lot of my work and 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 around a number of conversations that consider it is that you know when to work in textiles also is often in contrast to maybe something that is very surface driven like painting um or maybe working with given form and subtractive or additive like sculptures history so in textile, you might be building an image as you're making the thing. And I think at, like all three of us, that's very integral and very apparent, I think, in our works. Um, like the thing might, in, in my case, it might be a quilt, like an image doesn't come into being like as one thing. It sort of is worked on slowly and accumulatively. Um, and I think that's a, just a special provenance of textiles. I think these histories of um, Rosie Lee Tompkins' life experience really points to that for sure. Like um, the ability to like pick something up and put it away and pick it back up, and um, that you didn't need like a special space for that. It didn't. You didn't have to deal with wet media, messy things, tools that you couldn't afford. Um, you know, like those are things I, I think about a lot. Like uh, textiles origins in being portable. You know, like you can pick it up and move with it. Um, or things I, I kind of think of as like small markers that, that might make textiles stand out a little differently than, than some other mediums. Thank you. We have some, I'd like to move toward the Q&A from, um, from our guests. And Julia has a question. 
Can the four of you discuss the complexities of displaying quilt-based work in museum contexts? I'm thinking of issues of tactility versus prohibitions against touching, for instance, as well as how many textiles work in motion or activation versus wall-based displays. Have yeah, anyone experienced so that kind of gap between, you know, how you would love for it to be experienced by visitors versus what museums <laughs> allow? One of my favorite stories from the Seattle Art Museum is about a security report in which uh, it was reported that a, a six-year-old ran up and hugged my sculpture. And I thought that was like the best, like the best um, security report ever. But I think like one of the things that um, is caught, like seems really like a thread through all of our practices is just like the sensual nature that accompanies cloth. And it does like um, beg us to touch or smell or like we have our own history with material. And so when you see it, in a sculpture, I think it it talks to our bodies and our senses in a different way than paint, right? It's like a really different way. And I'm saying yeah. this as a painter too. Um, and so I, I honestly like really struggle with those divisions. I think that there's sometimes time, like opportunities to have tactile and touch experiences. Um, but I'm also, I think it's like this negotiation with instu institutions to, um, figure out like how, how that can happen. And in some installations in that I do, there's opportunities for people to write down their blanket stories and share those stories. And I think it's a way of calling up that object and recalling those, those senses. Um, but I, I honestly, if it was up to me, I'd, I'd allow people to, to touch, to touch more perhaps. <laughs> Same here. I mean, some, oh yeah. Some, I sometimes, sometimes I don't know um to be honest like I remember like when I would when I teach my students sometimes I do I, I'd love to smell the surface like especially if I couldn't understand what it was and if I what they were using and if I didn't understand it sometimes I'd actually lick it <laughs> <laughs> but you know and then they would look at me really crazy I said I'm just trying to understand what I'm looking at you know like all of these senses are important um touch taste um smell you know using your eyes um but yeah, I remember when, you know, I had uh, done the Sao Paulo Biennial and um, I created a, an installation that was very much like a kid's playroom. And then we made um, all of these, um, all of these balloons out of like fabric. So just like how you'd make, um, you, you make those Easter eggs out of paper. And it was, um, I think the day the biennial had opened, it was a national holiday. So, and, and the biennial was free to the public. <laughs> so all these kids came in and just saw the balloons and they said, football. <laughs> so they just went <laughs> kicking all of them. <laughs> which, I, which I thought was like really wild that, you know, that they saw the space and understood that it was theirs. But then of course that then also, totally freaked out the um, uh, the organizers of the biennial. So then they put a security guard at the front and only like five people at a time could enter the room. Um, so there are these points of negotiation sometimes when I think like it's, it's or say for example, when, when I uh, did the project with all those coffins um, and where people are actually asked to, uh, people are actually asked to come and help make them. And then later on, um, a few of those people came and walked with them and then it was open to even more people beyond those people to walk with them in the um, in the carnival. Um, sometimes uh, for me, it just depends on the intent of the work. Um, but if let's say, for example, I remember the first time when I showed um, a floor based work and it was sitting directly on the floor um, and somebody just walked right across it. Um, which was not its intent, you know? So all I could think was there's a body on there and there's a body that I'm trying to reference that's being disrespected on your own. The only thing you can think of is um, walking across from it. Or when people would stand in front of the, like it's always interesting to come into an, um, like come into the, uh, an exhibition. I love when people don't know that I'm there. Um, and just to listen to people um, and then to see people immediately go and take like a photo 
and then post it on Instagram and go, look at me, this matches my shirt. And then they fail to recognize that over their shoulders are the faces of children with bullet holes through them that I never seem to think about like those tensions. They're just, and so the, there are these moments in the work where like, it's about like, well, you know, like you don't need to touch this because the idea is that these bodies have been touched enough. So let's just take some time and make some space. Mm -hmm. um, and so it just depends for me on, on its intent. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I have one small thing to add to that. I, um, my work's not been shown in a lot of high profile places like Marie and Ebony where it's been that big of a concern. It's usually like smaller community galleries, which I'm happy to like, cause normally they're interested in accommodating me and those things. With the Invasive Queer Kudzu project, every part of that is actually touchable. It's, it's one aspect of the project is um, activating these archives and like actually introducing, you know, like younger Southern queer people to their own lineages that they're so unaware of, you know. Um, you know, it's, I mean, especially around like a number of important issues, like from, from public health, from, you know, like people who are young queer people now do, don't have a sense of the AIDS crisis. Uh, in the gravity that it that it wreaked um, on on the queer community, um, so just ha like it's a it's a like to hold something uh, from a, a, a collective history of your own minoritarian group is something I'm really deeply interested in, um, and sort of getting them out of these um, special spaces where I understand the need to protect them. If we if we didn't protect certain archival things, it would would be, it would be lost. Um, but it's why a lot of that work is, uh, and it's, I don't imagine you could have seen it from some of my details, but the, it's a lot of like digital scans and photographs that are printed on cloth and that's printed in a permanent way that people can touch it. And it's, yeah, I guess over time, you know, like I, I like Ebony, I'm like, well, I will let the, whatever institutions deal with it. A, an interesting note about those is that a lot of those are gonna return to the archives that they came from. And mm -hmm. that's kind of an active conversation. and. Um, mm -hmm. Sometimes like there aren't ar archives in a particular way, but like some of the LGBTQ community centers I've been to in different places, um, you know, have, have asked if like at some point, future point, they can like receive back the binds that their community made. And, and so I'm very open to that. Ideally, it would be a project that would just sort of like dissolve into um, and across um, these Southern community centers. Um, but it's, um, yeah, it's, uh, it's a good question. I don't, I don't know. I'd be curious to know what you think, Julia Brian Wilson, <laughs> about tactility. Um, I think we all have a sense of like, um, why it's so special in, in the materials we choose. Um, but I think when things enter the institutional realm, it's, it's, is that always about an intimate experience? And, and how much can any institution drive that? a uh, sense of intimacy between a one-to-one a -one viewer and object. Thank you, everyone. I think we're at time, so I think we will we will wrap up this discussion. And, and Marie, I wrote down something so profound that this is going to stick with me. My stories change when I know your stories. I think we'll end on that note. Thank you so much to the three of you, Marie, Aaron, and Ebony, for sharing your stories, sharing your work. Um, I feel like we, we could continue this conversation in many different directions in many different moments, but I really thank you and appreciate you. Bye, Thanks everyone. Thanks for having us. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye, everyone.